We've got the, con the group here. Well, good afternoon. We're here, as you see behind us, the Sanibel Causeway. I'm here joined with Kevin Guthrie, uh, Division of Emergency Management Director. Uh, we have the Sheriff, Carmine Marcino. We've got some of the uh, county commissioners I saw, state reps, Jared Perdue, Florida Department of Transportation, Eric Salagi, CEO of Florida Power and Light, uh, Melissa Satius, State President for Florida for Duke Energy, uh, Denise Vidal, CEO of Lee County Electrical Cooperative, uh, and then uh, do we, I didn't see, is Michael Bjorklin here? Where is he? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, good. Thanks for coming. He's the Executive VP for the Florida Electrical Cooperatives Association. And of course, Holly Smith, Mayor of Sanibel. I see Jimmy Petronas here as well, our CFO. So I want to thank them uh, for being here. So we, uh, as many of you know, that uh, when the dust settled off this hurricane, you saw the Sanibel Causeway severed in three different locations. We, of course, were flying in search and rescue immediately after the storm passed, and that was the number one priority in those uh, original days, and rightfully so. Uh, but we also understood that there was going to be a lot of need for services because we needed to make sure we could rebuild these islands, including Sanibel. Uh, we had folks come to me, um, I guess over a week ago now, uh, say, asking about the Pine Island Bridge. Is there something could be done? A lot of people said you just can't do it. People need to leave the island. That was not acceptable for those residents. And so we work with FDOT. We said Florida would, would take it on and we were able to produce a temporary uh, bridge in three days. And so they've had access now for almost a week uh, on Pine Island. Sanibel, as you can see, a little bit more complicated because you have three, that's a bigger uh, cause, it's a big causeway three different locations. And so what we did was last week had air assets bring in electrical workers, utility workers, people that could help with a lot of the infrastructure damage that was done. As well, last week, we started deploying barges to Sanibel Island with equipments and supplies for power restoration. We also wanted to assure wraparound services like running water are available as quickly as possible. And at the end of the day, we're in a situation where even though we're working really hard on this causeway, we didn't want to wait until that was somehow completed before you even started on the other stuff. So we had to figure out a way to get people there. So they have been there and they've been working and we're, we're really proud that people have done it. Uh, but uh, as good as that is, you know, you can only helicopter or barge so many people and so much equipment. So we were looking at ways, how can we get more trucks on the island of Sanibel as soon as possible? Kevin Guthrie and I had talked with the feds about potentially bringing in almost like an amphibious landing craft that would bring, like it could bring tanks in the military. And then we said, okay, well, we will do that if we can load up all these trucks. Uh, however, as we were working on those arrangements, and we actually would have had that here probably when? Today or yet? Tomorrow? Yeah, so this week we would have had that. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually very happy to be able to report that's not going to be necessary uh, because moment, any minute now, right behind us, the temporary Sanibel Causeway repairs that have already been undertaken uh, will allow this massive convoy that you see out there 200 bucket trucks, 150 line and pickup trucks towing 50 trailers, two tractor trailers, other first responders. They are actually going to be able to cross Sanibel Causeway and drive onto the island today. And this includes Lee County Electrical Cooperative, FPL, Duke, other partners. They brought in other folks from the uh, municipal and the co-ops that are here helping a massive numbers of people. I mean, I said over a week ago, we wanted uh, Lee County to have more linemen anywhere, and you've seen that. I mean, if you're driving in here, massive convoy. So the convoy is going to get there. They are going to be working to restore the power situation. It will require some of this to be rebuilt. I mean, for those of you who've been out on that island, you know, you see concrete poles, utility poles snapped in half 
and that's actually a pretty common sight to see. So it is going to require a lot of manpower. It's going to require a lot of effort, uh, but, but it's something that will be done. Uh, so that will end up really moving this forward from uh, where we otherwise would have been. Because if you think about it, if we didn't do the, the, the causeway, or if we did, had let the causeway linger and then didn't send anyone on the island, then nothing would have happened up to this point. And so we're happy to have done that. Now, once the convoy goes across, they have to continue with some of the repairs. It is not going to be ready to have full-time civilian traffic. And so we said that this was something that would be done uh, by the end of October. And I'm actually able to report now that, uh, 21, 21st. that this will be open for uh, civilian use October 21st. So that's going to be an amazing thing to have. And we're happy to be able to do that. So are they going? There you go, guys, right behind us, ahead of schedule. It was supposed to be 3 o'clock today. They thought they'd get it. Now they got more, and it's going. And that's going to be a bit. Now, you notice you got to go pretty slow because this is a temporary patch, but we're happy that that's something that is being done. Uh, we also are happy, of course, we did do the Pine Island Bridge, so that allowed a lot of uh, electrical. You have LCEC, Duke Energy, that are on Pine Island. Now, there's some significant damage to the infrastructure there. I saw a lot of lines down, utility poles broken. So they're working. Uh, they believe that um, this week uh, you will have at least one quarter of the island restored, including uh, the island center, water treatment plant substation, and then grocery stores like Publix and Winn-Dixie, and they'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, Next week, uh, you're going to have the northern part uh, as well as Matt Lachey. So that'll be really, really good. So bottom line is there's major progress being done because that bridge has allowed us to get the people across that need to get across. And um, there's a lot of folks. I mean, Pine Island people are very resilient. They have, they're running their generators. They were doing all that like right at the beginning. But it sure is better to be, to be hooked up to the grid. So that's what's being worked on. And it's really been, I think, a, a great effort. I mean, I think I can report now in one of these. They're all going to come up and speak who are running these, uh, these electrical outfits. But I think statewide now, other than the barrier islands, uh, I think you basically have 1,000 people that are without power in the entire state of Florida. And so that's a pretty significant undertaking. There will be some homes that may not be able to receive power will require an electrician to come out and make sure things, because there was a lot of damage with the flooding and other things, and that's just the nature of it. But now we're in a situation where you're really looking at, at those barrier islands, and we've got probably more resources than have ever been put to bear on any one of those things. So I just want to thank everybody that's been involved in that. I also want to thank the First Lady of Florida for doing the Florida Disaster Fund, over $41 million that we've raised for that. And if you want to go, you can go to floridadisasterfund.org, floridadisasterfund.org, or text disaster20222 if you want to make a contribution. And we've got more people that are going to contribute. Other charitable groups want to get involved. So you're going to see more, and I think it's going to make a difference. But how some of that money's going, I was just in Charlotte County yesterday. You know, they have a group that what they do is they bring massive amounts of tools to areas of disaster, and they loan them out to different groups that are going to help. So you'll have some group that's going to go to your house, and they're going to remove debris. They need a chainsaw. They can just get the chainsaw from this group and do. So that's a group that's gotten support. We're also working and have hopefully have an announcement today um, about, about helping some of our first responders that were displaced by this. So there's a whole host of good that can be done with it, and we're really, really happy that that's the case. Um, one other thing I know because, for, first of all, they did a really good job of restoring fuel. I don't think we really truly had a fuel shortage. I think it was just some of the gas stations didn't have electrical in places where that was a problem. Kevin sent trucks, tankers to places like Arcadia. They sent places to, to send it to Dunbar to help the residents. So we're happy to have done that. We have, in effect, a fuel tax holiday for the state tax in Florida, 25 cents a gallon. So what that means is Florida actually now has the fourth lowest gas prices in the United States. So, so that, that's the good news of that. 
The bad news is, I mean, OPEC is cutting. The price of gas is going through the roof in a whole bunch of places. And so we have provided relief. It would be higher if we hadn't done that. But I think, and I've been saying this for now many weeks, you are going to see, I, unfortunately, I think you're going to see the price of gas go up uh, by, between now and the end of the year. And it could go up substantially given all the dynamics that we're seeing, particularly with OPEC cutting production. And, of course, our own production has been neutered intentionally, which is not, I think, a very good decision. But nevertheless, that leaves a lot of pain at the pump. So uh, it has gone up, uh, and I think it will be because of the policies we see. But Florida's fourth lowest, largely because we do have our gas tax holiday in effect. So I just want to thank everybody for their effort. I'm glad that we're able to move this stuff ahead of schedule. It's a great sight to see, to see all those trucks going out there on Sanibel. I know that there's a lot of work to do. And I know it's going to take a lot of effort, but that's what you want to see. It shows you that we're, we're stepping up to the task. So, okay, we're going to hear from some of our, our speakers, starting with Kevin Guthrie. Thank you, Governor. Thank you again for your continued support of the division and the state agencies are responding in your leadership. This image behind us showcases the tireless work and the commitment the administration has made to restoring power and resources to communities in Southwest Florida. Myself and Jared Perdue were just talking before we came out here that there's never been the cooperation between state agencies. And I know we've said that a couple of times now, but that's directly attributed to the leadership of this man standing to my left to put together a team that doesn't have ego. They check it at the door and we just work together for the common good of those individuals that are Floridians. So again, Governor, thank you for that. It also represents a massive lo logistical operation that the division has implemented to ensure the proper commodities transportation and equipment of resources were in place to immediately respond to the, hur the impacts of this hurricane. To date, the division has deployed or is actively deploying, as you see behind us, the following resources for distribution to the impacted areas on the Barrier Islands. Four barges to aid in the delivery of commodities in Lee County and Pilot Island and Sanibel Island. Three heavy trucks that are a part of this convoy going across that will then continue on to North Captiva Island trailers for restrooms, showers, laundry, sleeping, sanitation to ensure the care of first responders in the field, and drone teams to assess flooded areas. The division has also opened an additional fuel depot on Pine Island for a total of 13 fuel depots across the central, Florida, central and southwest Florida to provide fuel to first responders and those hardest, in, uh, those hardest hit impacted areas. A public mobile fuel depot is open to provide fuel for vehicles and gas cans for generators to impact the residents in the Waukehatchee Recreation Center and Park in, Hil in Harlem Heights. These fueling depots have dispensed over 1.2 million gallons of fuel to these individuals. In addition, the division has also distributed nearly 50 million gallons of water, I'm sorry, 50 million bottles of water, over 13 million shelf-stable meals. The division stands ready to at, stands ready to continue the heavy logistical work. We are also committed to ensuring that residents have support they need to navigate the recovery process. I am pleased to announce that, uh, that two additional disaster recovery centers have opened, this uh, being Polk County and Seminole County. Polk is at the W.H. Stewart Center and Seminole is at the Seminole State College. These one-stop shops provide residents with the needed assistance to better help them understand the recovery process. This includes speaking with res uh, representatives on site, learning more about programs, getting an update on the status of your FEMA application, speaking with someone to help you understand any letters or notices you receive from FEMA, and information in locating housing or rental assistance. We understand that navigating the recovery process and programs available may be very overwhelming. Please know that the, that the division, along with local, state, and federal partners, will be, we'll be there with you throughout this entire process. FEMA has started sending out letters to individuals. Some of those letters are approval letters. Some of those letters are non-approvals. I want everybody to understand that in many cases when FEMA sends out a non-approval letter, all they're asking for is additional information. You have the opportunity to provide additional information and then have your claim approved. Do not think that just because you get a letter that says either denial or not approved doesn't mean that's the end of the line. Read the entire portion of the letter, 
that ask what it is that they need to see from you before you go down an appeal process or denial process. Governor, again, thank you so much for your leadership. And to all of our state agencies, thank you very much. Okay, Garrett Purdue. Thank you. Thank you, Governor DeSantis. Um, I really am privileged to serve under Governor DeSantis' leadership. It continues to get results day in and day out. I'd also like to recognize Director Guthrie for his continued hard work and great partnership. Um, without, without Director Guthrie, without the governor's leadership, we would not be able to mobilize the resources that we've mobilized and get things done as quickly as we have. Uh, the Department of Transportation's top priorities is always safety and mobility. And as you've heard and seen these last few weeks under emergency conditions, those don't change. They actually get amplified. So many dedicated FDOT staff came from all over the state and are here working around the clock to help every single community recover from the storm. Since the storm passed, various crews jumped into action to ensure mobility and safety through all of the disaster areas. They've performed over 2,500 bridge inspections, made 5,000 miles of state roads passable for emergency responders, and also restored thousands of traffic signals to operation. Construction work also commenced, as you've heard, to regain access to the barrier islands that were cut off from the mainland. With our partner, Lee County, and our contractor, Des Moya, we were able to restore access to Pine Island in under three days, showing the drive and commitment that FDOT and all of our team members have in helping Florida families recover. Now we've moved on to do the same with the Sanibel Island Causeway. Hundreds of trucks and equipment have been mobilized to the area, and various crews are now working along the entire project corridor. Crews have been working in parallel at different locations along the entire causeway, both land side and marine side, as you can see, to expedite repairs and make today's convoy of utility trucks, personnel, and support vehicles possible. The majority of the work to repair the causeway consists of restoring the roadway and land that led up to the bridge structures. As you've heard from the governor, there was significant damage to the land part of the causeway. The actual bridge structures, um, thankfully, are in good shape and have been inspected and are safe for passage. And so now it's really a matter of getting the causeway rebuilt and linking everything back together. Ajax Paving and Superior Construction have been working nonstop to get the temporary repairs far enough along to get the convoy through today. And once all of these trucks are across, the next step will be to lay asphalt and road striping to get the facility open to the public. FDOT understands how desperately drivable access is needed, and the original estimate to have the Sanibel Island Causeway open was by the end of the month. As, as you heard from Governor DeSantis, um, after mobilizing the equipment and crews and the progress we've made over the last week, we're happy to report that the repairs are now going to be open to the public by October the 21st. Governor DeSantis continues to think beyond the normal way of doing business to bring relief to communities the quickest way possible. And that is very apparent today, bringing all the experts and resources together, getting everybody aligned behind a common goal, and truly making a difference in people's lives. Knowing the damage that was sustained here, it's incredible that just after a week of work, we're able to bring almost 400 utility trucks over the causeway. Governor DeSantis asked us to deliver, and that's what we plan to do. Our teams in Lee County will be pushing even harder to get it done as fast as we possibly can. Working in coordination with our partners has helped allow us to serve Floridians quickly and efficiently, and I would like to thank all of our law enforcement partners and first responders and emergency responders. Thank you so much. Here at FDOT, we especially have a very close partnership with our transportation partners in the Florida Highway Patrol. They've been a huge help in providing mobility and safety throughout this whole storm event. FDOT looks forward to the days ahead as we make further progress on the temporary repairs and offer this community one more step towards recovery. Thank you, Governor. Okay. All right, um, Eric Salagi, FPL. Thank you, Governor. You know, Hurricane Ian has been uh, life altering for so many of our fellow Floridians, particularly all of those here in southwest Florida. And as the governor said, the road ahead is going to be difficult. Uh, for some, unfortunately, it's going to take months, if not years, to completely rebuild everything that Ian you know, has robbed from them in just a matter of hours. And of course, our thoughts and prayers go out to all of those who have lost loved ones during this storm. 
But if there's one thing that I know about Floridians, it's that we're resilient. And I can tell you that I speak every single day with Denise and leaders at Lee County Electric Cooperative uh, to coordinate our working with them to support all that we can do because we are all part of Team Florida. We know firsthand the challenges of restoring on islands and the creativity that it actually requires. Just yesterday, FPL completed the restoration of all of our customers on Little Gasparilla Island, which meant using barges to move trucks and equipment and even floating some poles across Gasparilla Bay here in order to get the equipment over to them. We had to remove trees and debris and clear a landing spot for the barges, and we've had to use all-terrain vehicles in order to transport some of the equipment once on the island. The restoration, frankly, doesn't get any more difficult than that. But we remain committed to helping Sanibel Island rebuild, and we will work with Lee County Electric Cooperative and all of their teams who are working so hard to restore power to all of their customers. We continue to provide support, including a restoration workforce of more than 200, of which we just saw some roll across the bridge, over 500 power poles, lots of critical equipment that is now, thanks to the efforts of DOT and everybody to get that bridge open, flowing onto the island. Look, I know it's difficult to be without power, and so I want to say thank you for your patience and your understanding. Uh, it is a real challenge. I am happy to announce on Fort Myers Beach, now that it is safe to restore power, we have actually energized Fort Myers Beach and last night turned on our first street lights on the southern part of the island. We are working through the day, we'll work through the night, and we'll continue to get more street lights up. Unfortunately, most of the buildings there are not able today to accept power safely, but when they are, FPL will be ready to energize them. Finally, I want to conclude by thanking Governor DeSantis for bringing everybody together during this time of need. Look, leadership in these circumstances particularly matters. And every single time I picked up the phone, which was unfortunately frequently, and called the governor and asked for help, you were there. That matters. It matters in being able to get things done quickly and safely. I also want to take a moment to thank our chief financial officer, Jimmy Petronas. Look, it matters that Florida went into this storm season financially strong with an A-rated balance sheet because if there's one thing we also know about storm restoration, it's not cheap. This is a multi-billion dollar issue that we are going to have to deal with as a state, and we are going into this financially strong thanks to your leadership as well, Jimmy, so thank you. I also want to take a moment to thank all law enforcement, sheriff here, Lee County, but also across the state, Florida Highway Patrol, Division of Emergency Management, the Department of Transportation, and the National Guard, none of the ability to move the equipment, the people, what we need to do to get this job done is possible without their support and their teamwork, so thank you. With this restoration, it's been a colossal effort, and I personally could not be more proud to be part of Team Florida. So again, I just want to say it's going to be tough going forward, but we're going to get through this together. We're going to come out on the other side stronger. I appreciate everybody's support and their patience, and I thank you very much. Okay. Denise? Thank you so much, Governor and Team Florida. Hurricane Ian's tragic level of widespread and long-lasting devastation to our region's people, homes, businesses, and way of life is unprecedented in Florida's modern history. Here at Ground Zero, we've been fortunate to be working so closely with the Governor's Office and the Florida Department of Emergency Management to secure resources and equipment needed like everything behind us right now for this monumental restoration effort. We're also very thankful to the Florida Electric Cooperatives Association, Duke Energy, and FPL for helping us secure the many dedicated and specialized mutual aid power crews and other support staff that were needed. I also have to thank the locals, and you've heard it a couple times now, we are just so resilient. Our customers, our first responders, our businesses, we have all joined together to help the community rebuild. You see the efforts on every corner, and everyone's contribution goes such a long way to recovery. 
This has truly been a Team Florida event. We will continue powering on until all service is restored in our beautiful Southwest Florida communities. Thank you, Governor. Okay. <laughs> Melissa? Uh, good afternoon. It has been an absolute privilege for Duke Energy uh, to come to your community to help you get back to your lives and restore service. Uh, we, like all the previous speakers, really appreciate the collaboration with the governor, his entire team, Kevin Guthrie and the Florida Emergency Management Team, uh, Lee County Cooperative and CEO Denise Vidal, uh, the Sheriff's Department, um, and really just the entire Lee County community that welcomed us into your neighborhoods. Uh, Duke Energy is exclusively working on Pine Island right now. A lot of those resources there are actual Duke Energy employees who lived through Hurricane Michael. And we just marked that milestone of that event just this week. They know firsthand what it is like to have your lives destroyed and to rebuild. So they bring an extra commitment and dedication to get power restored to Pine Island. You know, I think most importantly what this shows is just the resiliency of the human spirit. Um, all of the crews that I've talked to, the leaders, damage assessment, they all talk about how welcomed that they have felt here in Lee County and by the many agencies that you all have heard from. And you have my commitment that Duke Energy will be on Pine Island until we are ready to restore, uh, working with Lee County Cooperative and we believe that we are very close to that milestone probably this weekend. Thank you. Well, we're, we're uh, excited to see the progress behind us. We know that there's a lot more to be done and we're gonna continue to work with, with all the uh, available hands to have them on deck helping out uh, our Southwest Florida communities. And so it's a good day to see that. Uh, people wouldn't have predicted that. I mean, we're not even two weeks you wake up Thursday morning, you saw the causeway severed in three different places. I don't think very many people would have thought you'd see those utility convoys going over less than two weeks after that. But nevertheless, you know, that's what's happening, and we're going to continue to do more. Okay. Anybody have any questions? I'll let Jimmy, because he's, he's been all over this. Thank you, Governor. And look, you've got, you've got the, the microphone that needs to be used right now. Out-of-state contractors are not welcome in the state of Florida, plain and simple. If you're not a licensed Florida contractor, you can try to do work under a Florida-based contractor. But what's going to happen is you're going to be left holding the bag. So you're I need you to help empower the homeowner. They're going to get claim money from their insurance carrier. They need to use a licensed Florida contractor to do that work, nobody else. The, I was so proud yesterday, I saw a, uh, a sound bite from the Secretary of the Department of Business and Professional Regula Regulation, Melanie Griffin. She had a stack of signs, this tile, of unlicensed contractors coming in this state. Friends, if you do work with an unlicensed contractor and then later you decide to get insurance on your house, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to secure insurance. It's unlicensed, unpermitted work. So err on the side of caution. Do your homework. Make sure it's a licensed Florida contractor so we can protect you. Thank you, Governor. Okay. Governor, Caitlin Knapp with Fox 4. You re repeatedly have talked about using Operation Blue Roof. Some people don't qualify if they have a slate roof, clay tile. What are you doing to help those people that don't qualify? Kevin. So the individuals that do not have any, uh, cannot take on a, a U.S. Army Corps Blue Roof, they, there's a couple of things there. We, we put out yesterday as a part of our press release, I don't have that phone number right in front of me, but if people need disaster assistance at their home, we can certainly have them call that 1-800 number, ask for that assistance at their home. We'll send volunteer organizations and whatnot to help them. What they'll probably do is put up some type of blue, uh, blue tarp, not a blue roof, but a blue tarp, and then somehow figure out how they can get the, that attached to the fascia of the actual roof system. So they obviously cannot put that through the tiles and whatnot. But again, I'll have my staff make sure that everybody in this media market has that 1-800 number again. But that's where they would want to go to get that assistance. Again, that's free assistance where we match up nonprofit organizations to come around and help get those things done. Governor, Governor uh, President uh, 
Well, so uh, if you look, what we did a big effort called Resilient Florida that I launched, and we got uh, over a billion in funding over two years, and that was just basically recognizing that this state, because we're a peninsula in an area where a lot of tropical activity, that this is something you know that we've had to deal with throughout our history. Uh, we've had uh, stretches where we've had significant major hurricanes. A hundred years ago, uh, 80, 90 years ago, the most powerful hurricane to ever hit Florida was in the 1930s on La uh, Labor Day hurricane. The most deadly was in the 1920s Okeechobee hurricane. So what we're trying to do is create infrastructure and protections that are going to be able to withstand extreme weather events. Actually, I think you've seen some success already. A lot of the stuff that was done on Fort Myers Beach with the electrical there was not nearly as much destruction as there would have been 20 years ago with, with inferior materials. You look at some of these subdivisions here in Lee County, granted, they got flooded, which is bad, but you didn't see mass subdivisions of new construction just, just reduced to rubble. So I think that that's something that, that's really significant. I think our after Hurricane Andrew, Florida updated its building codes. We've now done a lot, my term as governor, to help with some of the critical infrastructure, make that more resilient. Uh, it does matter, and it does make a difference, and I think people people are seeing that in, in the aftermath of the storm. Even some of the mobile homes. You look at some of the older mobile homes that didn't fare as well, but you look at some of the newer mobile homes, and you actually had most of these newer mobile homes. You go out here, and you go east, uh, there's a mobile home relatively new on the right. A lot of them did very, very well because there's, an, uh, there's a consciousness about understanding that the infrastructure